another fight that is uh, flying under the radar that I'm looking forward to is Gerald Mearshart against Andre Petrosky. And for the first time on this program, uh, we have the pleasure of welcoming in one Andre Petrosky, who, of course, is in Boston right now getting ready for UFC 292, his first fight of 2023. Let us say hello to him right now. Andre, my man, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Doing really good. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. And, uh, you know, we, we were very close to having you on uh, for the first time many, many moons ago. You were almost immortalized on our wall before ever coming on the show, which is a very rare feat. You were that close to making it happen in Abu Dhabi. Sean Brady was trying to make it happen. But as the kids like to say, I think, I think you may have fumbled the bag. I don't know. Do you, are, are you, were you even aware that all of this was going on? You walking out to the song and getting on the wall? I mean, this was a big spot, I thought. Yeah, so I, I went down to uh, the UFC guys, and I was like, this is the song I want to come out to. And they said John DeRoby already took the song. <laughs> and I was like, well, I fight before her. I don't care. We can both come out to the same song. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me do it. So it wasn't meant to be, Ariel. Okay, so this was during the, uh, the, the Island Boy craze. And uh, you're telling me that you actually went to the UFC and asked them to have that song first, but because she beat you to the proverbial punch, that's why she is now immortalized for life. On You were that close to having your mug on our wall forever. It was Virna Janjiroba that robbed you of this moment. Is that what you're saying? A day late and a dollar short. Golly, that's tough. All right, well, we'll figure out something else because I feel like the intentions were there. And uh, now I kind of feel bad for, for, you know, holding this against you. Um, nevertheless, great to have you on. <laughs> Big fight for you. By the way, uh, the hair situation, what is going on with the cheetah print on your, on your head? I've seen this photo. It's, what is, it's leopard. what is this? Oh, leopard. My, my apologies. My apologies. Yeah, what yeah, what yeah. is the inspiration here? Well, leopard, leopards are very fast and I have a, a, a distinct speed advantage in this matchup. Okay. Is uh, correct me if I'm wrong. First time you've done this before? The cheetah or the leopard? The leopard. I don't know. The leopard or the <laughs> cheetah. Have you ever done this? <laughs> correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, what inspired this? I don't know. I just wanted to do something different. I like. Uh, I went blonde before. I mean, that's a little played out. Everyone's, everyone and their mothers going blonde these days. So uh, I went with the cheetah. I like it. By the way, how long did that take? Oh, it took forever, like four hours because they had to do three different colors. So they dyed it, uh, the blonde, the platinum first, and then they did the yellow, which was a different color. And then they did the black and then they cut my oh, hair. God. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You didn't get restless in the chair for all that time. Oh, my God. I'm the I can't sit still. I'm the worst. Yeah. Will you do it again or is it one and done for you? Well, I guess we'll see how it pans out, huh? Okay, it depends on the result. <laughs> right, right. Okay, uh, so you mentioned that you, you have the speed advantage uh, against Gerald. When you were approached about fighting Gerald, he's been around the block, has had some some big wins, some great submissions as well. Did you like this matchup for you? Given where you're at in the UFC, undefeated, uh, you've won you know all your fights in impressive fashion, I would say, uh, four in a row since coming into the UFC. Did you feel like this was a good, proper next step for you? Were you looking for a bigger name? What were your thoughts? So I asked for the Mir Shark fight um, after I beat Maximov. So, um, yeah, I was thrilled. I, I, I was really excited about the matchup. I originally liked it because he has the most submissions in the history of the division. And I continue to make the same argument that you know, I'm the best grappler in the division. So knocking off the guy with the most submissions for further uh, cements my argument. Does the winner of this fight have to win via submission? Is there like a gentleman's agreement here between you guys? I feel like that's the only way that this could be truly settled. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Okay. Uh, very interesting. I like that. Uh, we, we did see you. Um, I said, this is your first fight of 2023. You did compete in a uh, fury pro grappling. Didn't go your way. Obviously tough night ankle lock. Did that kill? I feel like those kill. How did, how did you feel about that? It's like a part of jujitsu that um, I wish I had more time to focus on and do like the pure jujitsu stuff. But, you know, with MMA, a lot of it doesn't really apply. So that the jujitsu guys, uh, they, you know, they, they don't have to spend as much time working on striking and, and all the other stuff. So 
Um, I hate to give an excuse for why I lost, but yeah, that was it. Okay. And you were supposed to fight in early May and had to withdraw that, that Sterling Cejudo fight. What happened there? So I tore my rotator cuff. Um, yeah, but the UFC helped me a lot. I didn't end up needing surgery. Uh, I got stem okay. cells and I did like six weeks of rehab and, um, yeah, luckily it, it's been good ever since. I thought uh, you wanted to attend Sean Brady's wedding. That's why you couldn't fight that weekend. <laughs> um, unfortunately, no. No. Did you attend the wedding? I did not. Oh, we didn't get you. Didn't get invited. Aren't you boys? <laughs> I forget what I had that weekend. Okay. Now this I wish just I had got a better story maybe, for you, Ariel. <laughs> maybe you're not, boys. Did I did I screw up? Did something happen here? Did I am I did I just make this awkward? No, nah, I mean we're teammates. I just I I couldn't make it. He didn't invite you. Okay. Don't don't worry. He didn't invite me either. He didn't invite me. <laughs> he didn't invite me either. I was, so I, it's... I, I didn't make the cut. Okay, I didn't make the cut either. Just for, I, I was feeling Pfeiffer bad, so I'm happy. Cut. I didn't make the cut. He left Pfeiffer me for Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. Okay, here's the wow. details. He left me for Pfeiffer. Wow. Yeah. That's messed up. Pfeiffer made the it, cut. It all comes out now. Oh, my gosh. All right. Um, around that same time, though, uh, you, you posted something on your Instagram. And honestly, I never knew about this, but you, you tagged me in it, uh, which is one, one of the main things that I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, this was back on May 5th. Uh, just a quick recap of what you wrote. You said that your buddy, uh, Bobby Baldwin, called you yesterday. Five years ago, a judge gave me the option of going to get help instead of sitting in a jail cell, dope sick. And so they took me to a treatment center where Bobby did my intake. I was 168 pounds and a sad excuse of a human being. I didn't know many junkies who were able to stop, let alone fighters. The reality that I would likely spend the rest of my life an addict was starting to become more and more evident. I remember listening to Jared Gordon's story on Ariel Hawani's show and it giving me hope. That is why I feel it is my obligation to share a period of my life I'm ashamed of. I want to thank my beautiful mother for showing me what unconditional love is and the countless people who told me about the importance of a relationship with God. I am blessed that God removed the obsession from my life and gave me the ability to pursue my dreams. I can honestly say that I prayed for the life I live today. Today, my parents are proud of me. Yesterday, my daughter told me she wanted to be like me when she grows up. How dare I not be grateful? Uh, that, that is an incredible post and congratulations on on five years uh when when you heard that story from jared i've talked to jared a bit over the years about you know his his ups and downs and trials and tribulations where were you at in your life when when he when he spoke about that on the show i was uh i was still an amateur and i was getting high and i i like was really i didn't want to get high anymore like i was done with it it, it wasn't alluring at all and and i was really in a bad spot and i just didn't know how to stop and it was just getting worse and worse. And when then I, you, I, I would listen to your podcast a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, when yeah. were you first introduced to drugs? Uh, man, when I was like a kid, um, like maybe 15 or 16, I had this neighbor and uh, his mom would just give us like Oxy 80s when we were, when I was a kid and I would, wow. I tried it and loved it. And uh, you know, throughout high school i would like you know if you're cutting weight and you can't you know, all your friends are going out drinking and you know you can't drink that was kind of like my outlet at the time and uh yeah it just progressed worse and worse I, yeah it just got worse and worse and then eventually turned into heroin as with a lot of people from this area even you know you you were a d1 wrestler you're competing at the highest level in college even then are you are you using drugs so uh, there was times where I was able to stop and I would go away and, and get a, get out of, you know, Philadelphia and the area. And I, I did have uh, some times when stuff was good, but every time I came back, I would just slip back into the same, the same stuff, you know? What, what was rock bottom for you? So rock bottom was, um, I was like trying my last, at this point I was in, in real bad shape. Uh, I was like a bundle a day, just real bad shape. And I, I still fought. I did a kickboxing fight. And uh, this that was my last amateur fight. And I tried. I went home and I, I tried to kick at home. And I made it like three days. And I just couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was so sick. 
And I ended up going and getting high with this kid. And uh, I overdosed and on the way back. Um, I was coming back from Kensington and I overdosed. So he called the paramedics and uh, he pulled over somewhere like off 95. It was, it was in Ridley. And uh, when I came to, I like freaked out. I panicked and freaked out and I tried to run. And I, I was in no shape to run, obviously. So I ended up get I, I was tased. I pissed myself. And then they ended up taking me that I was arrested and I was taken to jail. Uh, I actually wasn't taken to jail. I was taken to the station. And uh, that was where, like, I got real sick. Like, within, like, 24 hours, I, I was in bad shape. But within 24 hours, I was, like, you know, shitting myself, begging the guard for toilet paper. Like, that was my rock bottom. And, and uh, <clears throat> like, I, I at this point, like, I really had no no belief in God or anything. And, and I got on my knees in the cell and, you know, threw up, like, the Hail Mary foxhole prayer, uh, like, the desperation. And that, that's what God means to me is like that gift of desperation. And, um, I said, you know, like, God, if, if you help me, help me here, like, you know, I'll never abandon you, blah, blah, blah. And, um, uh, yeah, my life has gotten just tremendously better ever since I went to a treatment facility. Um, I went to Malvern and I went through the whole program. Uh, I lived in a recovery house. Yeah. And then about when I was about a year, uh, sober, my, I, I, my daughter's mother was pregnant and uh i went to court and uh for all the charge i had a bunch of charges and i went to court and the district attorney was like oh so at this point so this allowed me to get sober and turn pro so when i was getting high i couldn't i didn't want to fail a drug test i was afraid to go pro so i went pro and when i when i went to court the district attorney was like hey he pulled me aside he's like hey i just want you to know like i, I watched your fight and like i'm really rooting for you and they wow. i pleaded guilty to disorderly conduct they dropped all the charges yeah i was i was really worried because i thought i was going to have no license and be on probation go to jail and then not be able to see my daughter and uh my daughter was born and and that changed me like that that <clears throat> i mean that totally changed me for sure like that was that was a big pivot in my life I, I i was just you know a selfish person like a real selfish piece of shit and uh my daughter continues to change me changes me every day gives me the chills uh but yeah she's four now and uh man like i i know it sounds corny but like the life that i live today like i prayed for everything like i never th i prayed to be sober one day and then i prayed that one day i would uh you know, one day I'd be able to not have to work and I'd have to, uh, I'd be able to just train and pursue my career. And that was like a big day for me when I didn't have to go to work anymore. Like <clears throat> there was a time when my daughter was, was a baby and I worked seven days a week during camp getting ready for a fight. And, um, yeah, like my life's just great to be four and oh in the UFC and have the opportunity to fight, you know, the guy with the most submissions in the division's history and me to continue to make this argument that I'm the best grappler in this division. Like I'm so lucky, man. Holy shit. What a life, man. What a, what a, what a story. Thank you for sharing. Just, I mean, I, I know that's just probably 0.5% of everything that you've been through that, that day that you were in the, the cell, if you will, and, and asking the, the guard for toilet paper, like, how long ago is that? How many years ago is that? That was the day before five years ago from the day I made that post. So it was uh, May 2nd. Wow. Wow. Is that the, is that the last time you ever took any kind of drugs? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I've been straight and, and ever since. I can't even imagine what's that like. And, and so you're begging him for help and are they just ignoring you? No, he would come and then he would say, Oh, well, yeah. And then the one time he was like, uh, the judge is coming in in a couple hours. You'll be fine. And I was like, dude, <laughs> Do you, th in that moment, do you think you're going to die? I wanted to die. <laughs> you just wanted to end it all. <clears throat> I mean, I was just fighting. Like <laughs> I was suffering bad. That was my rock bottom. That was my lowest yeah. point for sure. Could you even imagine all this? Could you imagine UFC? Could you imagine success? Or was that so far fetched at that point? Like, was it, was there any sort of glimmer of hope? <laughs> Like I said, you know, I, I heard Jared Gordon go through it. Um, and I heard a, um, 
a couple other people, like there was like one or two other people that I've heard their stories too, but Jared was the big one that, that gave me hope. But now, I mean, it, it, I, look, the reality is most IV drug user, IV heroin addicts, you know, life expectancy is about 26 years old, you know? So I, I didn't have, like, it was tough, man. And it was getting worse and worse. Like it, 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 my mentality at the time, like in the beginning was like, oh, I'll stop tomorrow. I'll stop tomorrow. I'll stop tomorrow. And then it was like, oh, I can manage this. Like I, I can manage this. Like I was still winning fights surprisingly. And then like, you know, when you're overdosing in jail, it, you're not managing anything like, right. So yeah, it just got worse and worse. I, I'm, I'm assuming, I, I, th I think you have a relationship with Jared, right? You, you've told him this. Do you, do you remember like the first time you reached out to him and, and told him what his story did for you? Yeah. I told him when I was still getting high, I said, Hey, like I heard your story and I'm struggling right now. Like, um, I just, you know, I appreciated it wherever. And he was able to steer me in the right direction. And, you know, wow. unfortunately it took, uh, a catastrophic event to, to really force me to get into the treatment center and make those serious changes to my life. Um, yeah, but he, he was, he definitely gave me a lot of advice at the time that was, that was helpful. I, I appreciate the fact that like you tell the story now and we just kind of listen to it and, and digest it and move on. But I can't imagine early on how hard it is to just cut all that out of your life. Were there ever moments where you were afraid that you would, you know, you, you would, you would go back to it and, and how did you fight those urges? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the gym I'm at now, I'm with, I'm in Kensington, my, my, Mark has MMA where I do my sparring is in Kensington and uh, we, we moved locations, but before we were right under the L and um, I remember the first day I went there because me and Joey were at a different team before we went to, before we came to Henzo Gracie Philly, we were with balance. And I remember the first day I went to that gym, I was in Kensington and I popped my rib out in the middle. Of, and the first day there I popped my rib out was in the middle of practice. And, uh, like I couldn't breathe. Like it was, it was bad. And, uh, I walked outside and I got my car and there I am in my car, like in excruciating pain, sitting in the middle of Kensington. And I'm like three, four, three, four months sober at this time. You know what I mean? Like in a bad spot. And I was like, man, like, and, and I actually didn't go back to that gym for a couple months after that. I was like, man, I just, that's not, I was scared. You know what I mean? Like I was scared mm -hmm. of, and luckily, like, you know, I, I said some prayers and I got out of there, but I just remember that being like a pivotal moment where I was like, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people may, may have turned back at that point and God, God had different plans for me that day. You know, I, I, uh, I've been lucky to do a lot of things, uh, in my career covering this sport. One of the uh, experiences that has stuck with me that I'll never, ever forget is spending a day in Kensington with Eddie Alvarez. I don't know if you've ever seen this interview, but we walked around the neighborhood and, you know, I, I've never been to a place like that before. And I'll never forget seeing syringes. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly the L train, you know, underpass. We walked through that. He took me on a tour. He showed me his house. Um, unfortunately, you would see people who were walking up and down the street who look like zombies. And so I can visualize everything that you're talking about here. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a heartbreaking experience to just like pop in there and, and, and see that. And it's, you know, in a major metropolitan city and then put, to pop out. And so, um, I know I, I can understand exactly what you're talking about when you describe this. And so now do you, you still live in Kensington? No, I live in New Jersey now, but I okay. still go to Kensington for practice. And my perspective on it now is,